service was full of solid protein. Yes. No, no milk in it. No. Says this, what good is it 
That's not the one. No, put up that. <laughs> the one by Edwin Burke, please. Thank you. All that is needed for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. Yes. Let me say that again. All that is needed for the triumph of evil is for good men to do nothing. I want you to think about that for a minute in light of the book of James and related to faith and works. It seems to me that in light of the book of James and this passage that we've read, that little phrase ought to read this way. In desperate and needy times, yes. the man who does nothing cannot be legitimately counted or defined as good. Oh my God. Let me yes. say that again. Yes. In desperate and needy times, the man who does nothing cannot be legitimately defined as good. Yes. Then James challenges the brothers, the brothers, that is, those who he considers brothers in Christ, in verse 14. He says this, if someone says he has faith but does not have works, can that faith save him? Listen, in this context, we need to realize that he was addressing believers in Christ. He called them brothers. Yeah. He called them brothers because he believed that they were believers in Christ. And therefore, he's talking about Believers in Christ at every age, and I think by extension, he's talking to, uh, to you and to me today. And it's appropriate to note that he's not asking this question of people afraid to fight or unable to step up to some daunting challenge. He's pointing to the poor person there in the corner who simply needs the most basic of human provisions and saying, where is your great faith yes. when this one goes without help and is uncared for? Yes. You see, none of us... None of us has arrived at the place where we don't need help from someone from time to time. Teach. Every one of us, no matter what our status in yes. life, needs the help of someone at some point. And yet, somehow we find ourselves turning up our nose at those who are less fortunate than we, who have less than we do. They may be a little dirty. They may... They may be a little smelly. They may have a past that you see is more than a little bit tarnished. Yes, sir. And you look down your nose at him or her, and you won't lift a finger to help him up, and yet you talk about your faith. Mm -hmm. Come on. My God. My God. Teach. So these questions arise in my mind. Where is your faith? And faith in what? Faith in whom? In Christ Jesus? In Jesus Christ, the one who burned himself out from sunup to sundown, feeding and touching and healing and giving hope. And then we compare his actions to the spiritual condition of America. Listen, there are people all around us today in these United States who are lacking the clothing of Christ's righteousness. There are people around us everywhere who are starving for the bread of life. Yes. There are people everywhere we go who are going without the living water that springs up to eternal life. But we somehow justify our lack of action because there's no real profit in all of that for the churches. I want to tell you a story. This is true, and it, and it was told to me by a pastor here in Oak Grove. I will not mention his name or the church that he is affiliated with, but he told me this. He said, I don't go after members for my church among the residents of Oak Grove. He said, because there's no money in that. He said, I'm looking for people in Clarksville who could come in who have money to sustain the ministry here. Brothers and sisters, if your church is planted in a place, then you need to find out where the people are in that community yes. that need to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. He wasn't interested in, in sharing the love to those who were needy, perhaps, on, only on. to those who could profit him come on, come on. and his church. Listen, all of us have heard stories of a lone hero. Someone who kind of rides into town and saves the day. We might even think bad about the big bad guy that he's having to face. We might hate that big bad guy, and we might feel a little fear and, 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 and sympathy or empathy for the hero. But you know what we don't feel? What, we, what do we feel about those good people in the town who knows what needs to be done, but nobody wants to step up and take action? Say that. Say that. They're not willing to pay the price for doing the right thing. Yes. Come on. I'm reminded of the story of the Good Samaritan. And you know, when, every time I think about that story, you know what comes to my mind? It's not the bad guys. 
that, that robbed him and beat him and left him bloody and, and bleeding on, on the side of the road. Yes. The people that I focus on in that story are those so-called religious leaders of that day who come by and see this man who is in need and pass by on the other side of the road. One of these was a priest and another one was a Levite. And these are men of God, supposedly men of God, and yet they refused to take action. It was the one who is despised, the yes. Samaritan, yes. who Come came on. and finally, yes. finally gave yes. hope yes. and help. Yes, yes, yes. James wants to know how he's supposed to believe in this faith that they profess if it remains dormant, if it remains invisible, if it remains ineffective. James said, your faith is useless. That was before politically correct days, okay? He, he might need to say it a little kinder today in this world, but it is, brother. It is what it is, okay? So listen, don't talk to me about your faith and sing your worship songs with your eyes closed and your hands oh lifted high, and yet you won't, you're not willing to give a dollar or lift a finger or speak the good news of the gospel to those who are dead and dying all around you. John Calvin wrote this. He said, it is faith alone that justifies. It is faith alone that justifies. However, but faith that justifies can never, ever be alone. And so in pressing the point home that a person who is saved by faith alone and not by works, we need to be careful to give equal stress to the point that true justification, listen to this, true justification will result in works that demonstrate the God life that yes. is within. Say that. Yes, Lord. Okay, Say here's the second question. Do you only have the faith of demons? Do you only have the faith of demons? In verses 18 and 19, we have a couple of statements tossed in by James that we must reflect on in order to be aptly impacted by the truth of the passage. The first part is pretty familiar to most of us. It's been batted around every time the works versus faith debate is backed up. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. But listen, listen, this verse has been misapplied, misunderstood, twisted, tweaked, and everything to the point where we completely miss the simplicity of it because the debaters of this verse are only focused on winning their argument and on doing justice to the scripture. James' point is very simple. And it's a challenge. And this is it. You cannot demonstrate faith apart from works. Why is that? It's because faith is invisible. Think about that. Faith is invisible. Without some indicator of it working in your life, it is only an empty profession of faith and nothing more. Okay, let me give you an example. I could stand up here today and say to you, I have, I am, I have psychic power. Make it plain, Pastor. Go ahead. I could stand up here today and say, I have psychic power. Yes. And you say, prove it. <laughs> well, see, there's where the problem lies. <laughs> because I can't tell you what's going to happen 30 minutes from now or an hour from now or five minutes from now. Yes. I don't have a clue what's going to happen. So it's easy for me to say, I have psychic power, but there's no way for me to prove that I have psychic power. Likewise, there are a lot of us who say, I'm a Christian. I believe in God. Where's the proof? My God. Prove it. Come on. Come on now. Prove Come on. it. Oh, my How God. do you prove that you believe in God, that you have a saving faith? As the old adage goes, the proof is in the pudding. That's all right. That's all right. Amen. The proof is in the pudding. That's all right. But it's in verse 19 that I think James clarifies what he means when he says this. You believe that God is one, you do well. Even the demons believe in God and shudder. Now listen, that faith should, should not shock you. If it shocks you, I, I'm kind of curious as to why. Where do demons come from? Do you know where, where, they, where they originated? Come on. Somebody say it out loud. Heaven. Demons originated in heaven. Come on. Okay? Come on. These, are, these were angels who followed Satan Teach. in trying to overthrow God Teach. and to take over heaven. Yes. And, and so they were cast out of heaven. 
with Satan their master, so we shouldn't be surprised that they believe. But when it comes suddenly in the course of a discussion on saving faith and the subsequent works, it makes us sit up and, and believe just a little bit, doesn't it? That demons believe? Well, in a sense they do, but they don't have saving faith. So here it is, if you haven't already figured it out. James is stating that just because you believe in God doesn't mean that you have saving faith. That's right. Come on. Listen, the daily confession of the devout Jew, even to this day, is found in Deuteronomy 6.4. It says this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. What does James say in verse 19? You believe that God is one. Deuteronomy says, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Even the demons believe that. Even the demons believe that. James' original reading audience is primarily, if not entirely, converted Jews. So in another of his politically incorrect utterances, he says, in essence, you declare your daily beliefs in one true God, but you aren't saying anything that the demons can't say unless, and this is vital, unless your declaration is backed up by works in keeping with repentance and true spiritual birth. Yes, yes, yes. You see, you see, just mentally agreeing to the existence of God and the content of the Bible means nothing by itself. Yes. Likewise, and you need to hear this, likewise, the fear of God and his wrath and the coming judgment means absolutely nothing other than just an emotional reaction to a truth that's been revealed to you. That's right. The demons believe and tremble. Mm. The question is, do you believe and tremble? As, as you're emotionally stirred when you hear the word preach and you're confronted with messages regarding righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, what, what does that result in? If nothing, then it's not a big deal at all. This, that sort of preaching frightened the governor named Felix in the book of Acts. It's recorded in Acts 24, 25, and it says this, And as he reasoned about righteousness... Listen to this. As he reasoned, this is the governor Felix. Paul had stood before him to defend his faith. And, and it says, as he reasoned about righteousness and self-control and the coming judgment, Felix was alarmed and said, go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. In other words, what he's saying here is, I, I need, you need to give me a little time to think about this. I need, I need to concentrate on this a little bit, okay? Well, look at what happened. It says that he did call back. Paul often to listen to him. Felix called him back time and again to listen to him. But in the end, it did him absolutely no good. Paul was rejected by him time and again until Paul was no longer available and neither was the message of salvation. As a result, his heart was hardened against the gospel forever. I want you to listen to this. We're going to put it on the screen so you can read it as well. It's a little bit long, but John MacArthur in his commentary on James states this. As far as factual doctrine is concerned, demons are monotheists. Monotheists. That means they believe in one God. Okay? They don't have any question about that. All of whom know and believe there is one true God. This is what demons believe. They also are very much aware that Scripture is God's word, that Jesus Christ is God's son, that salvation is by grace through faith, that Jesus died, was buried, and raised to atone for the sins of the world and that he ascended to heaven and is now seated at his Father's right hand. They know quite well that there is a literal heaven and a literal hell. But listen, all of that conventional knowledge, as divinely and eternally significant as it is, cannot save them. They know the truth about God, Christ, and the Spirit, but they hate it, and they hate God, Christ, and the Spirit. Listen, faith that does not result in God-appointed works is dead. Now, that's important. God appointed works. Yeah. Why is that? Because there are some people out there who have a motivation to do good works apart from God telling them to do these things. Yeah, say that. Say that. I was talking to a pastor friend of mine years ago. He used to be the pastor of First Baptist Church of Little Rock, Arkansas. He had then since retired from that position and was serving as a missionary when I was stationed in Korea. That's how many years ago it was. And I was speaking to him one time, and I asked him if the certain president that was from 
um, Little Rock, who shall remain nameless, uh, attended his church. And he said, no, he didn't attend my church. I said, I wonder why. He said, because we weren't on television. Listen, listen. He said, we weren't on television. There was a church right across the, the, the way from us that broadcast their service every Sunday. And he said, not only that, but he was a member of the choir. And he insisted that he sit on the front row, right in the center, just to the left side of the pastor, so that every Sunday, when people would turn, tune in and view their service, who would they see sitting in the choir? This president, who shall remain nameless. Was his motivation by God, given by God? No, he wanted to be known. He wanted to be seen by men so that they would glorify him and his good works. So you see, it isn't good works by itself. It's a case of faith that follows up with good works, okay? So we're going to keep going here. Just because you believe in God doesn't mean you have saving faith. Faith that does not result in God-appointed works is dead. Let's skip forward to verse 20. Do you want to be shown, it says, you foolish person, that faith apart from works is useless? So here we see for the fourth time now in this portion, James declares undemonstrated faith to be useless or dead. Now, listen, where the, where the devout Jew fell short in that day, and, and in today, if they, if they follow through with this thing, declaring God to be the one true God in Deuteronomy 6.4, they forget to apply the very next verse in Deuteronomy 6.5. It says this, you might, this might look familiar to you. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. You need to hear this. Knowledge of God and even fear of God because of revealed truth is useless apart from love for him because it is love for God that brings forth the fruit of faith, yeah. which according to Ephesians is good works prepared by God beforehand for us to walk in them. Ephesians 2.10. Question number three. Can you have saving faith without works? As we come to this section and to verse 20, I repeat that James has now indicated for the fourth time in only seven verses that faith apart from works is not really saving biblical faith at all, but empty and useless faith. He says it in verse 14 when he asks a rhetorical question, what use is it? Then he asks again in verse 16, verse 17, and now here in verse 20. James, listen, I love James. James is a preacher after my own heart. He does not pull any punches. He cuts straight to the heart of the matter, and he doesn't leave his reader, especially the one wanting to debate him, with any misgivings about where he stands. Note his tone of sarcasm in verse 19. You believe that God is one, you do well. He's saying that kind of tongue-in-cheek. He's basically saying, okay, you know something that even the demons know, and that knowledge isn't helping them one bit, is it? That's right, that's right. That's right. Come on. Take it time. <laughs> then here in verse 10, there could be no mistake, verse 20, there could be no mistake about how he views the one who is full of religious talk, but there's no substance. Do you want to be shown, you foolish person, that faith without works is useless? Now keep in mind, this letter is written very early in the life of the church. So these people that he's that he's writing to were Jews by birth and although converted to faith in Christ and learning and growing in their new life in him, many of them undoubtedly still harbored a great deal of pride in their Jewishness and the point that, that, that their father and their lineage goes all the way back to Father Abraham. So where John the Baptist warned the Jews not to rest on the fact that that source is acceptance of God, James uses it as his tool to make his point with them about faith and works. Look at verse 21. Here James brings up the event that they are all sharply aware of when Abraham offered up his son Isaac on the mountain. It says this, was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up his son Isaac on the altar? And then it continues on to verse 22. It says, you see that that, that faith was active along with his works. And faith was completed yes. by yes. his works. This, I think, is the sentence that should put all the debate concerning, yes. concerning faith versus works to bed. Listen, in truth, there should be no word versus between the words faith and works because they are each other's cause and effect. 
Listen, it says faith was completed by his words. Can it be clearer than that? Could there be a clear statement describing the relationship between true biblical saving faith and the resulting fruit of good and godly works? Was Abraham saved by faith? Was justified by faith alone? Yes. Romans 4, 13 through 16 tells us that. It says this. For the promise of Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Can you put that up there, brother? Uh, Romans 4, verse 14 now. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there is no transgression. Now listen to verse 16. That is why it depends on faith in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abraham, who is father of all. So, while justification is by faith alone, faith that justifies is never alone. It is evidenced by good works. Look at this. It was faith that brought Abraham and his son to the mountain. It was faith that caused Abraham to tell those men who went with him to wait here because I and the boy will go over to worship and then we will come back. We, we meaning the boy and me, will be back together. It was faith that, that allowed Abraham to take his son and place him on the altar, tying his hands and his feet. And it was faith that raised the knife. And listen, if God had not intervened, then it, was, it would have been faith who would have plunged the knife into the heart of Isaac. Because Abraham believed God and he believed the promises of God and he believed that God then was even able to raise someone from the dead and bring him into being that which does not exist. Listen, faith with, was active along with his works and because of the works, faith was completed. So this is it. Faith without works is incomplete faith. But the works that come from faith completed. There can be no faith versus works. It's only faith and works. So even if you can point back to a particular day, a particular hour, and a particular minute, when you pray to prayer and ask Jesus to save you and come into your life, listen, that proves nothing to those around you. What convinces them, and honestly, what will convince you of whether you have saving faith or not is who you are, listen, every single day of your life. You say you have faith? Where's the proof? Where's the fruit? Listen, I'm in the same boat. I have to check my own daily existence and answer to God honestly concerning the product of my faith. Is it there or not? Is my faith complete or is my faith unfruitful? And so do you. The safest thing you can do for your eternal soul is to honestly, listen to this, is to honestly evaluate what you call your faith in God. Honestly evaluate it and then get rid of any hypocrisy, Come on. get rid of any self-deception, and answer this question honestly in your heart of hearts. And here's the question, verse uh, number four. Yeah, Is my faith working with my works and therefore making me perfect? Let me say that again. Is my faith working with my works and thereby making me perfect? Listen, I hope so. I hope that's the case with you because... That is the faith that brings glory to God. That is the faith that saves the sinner. That is the faith that accomplishes the work of the kingdom that demonstrates Christ's righteousness to an unrighteous world. It's the same faith that brings light to the darkness that makes the saint complete. Listen, any other faith, any other faith is no better than the faith of the demons. Let me say that again. Any other faith is no better than the faith of the demons. So what about you? Does your life reflect your faith? A long time ago, someone once coined this phrase. I heard it way back when I was a youth pastor for the first time. It says this, if you were arrested for being a Christian, would they be able to gather enough evidence to convict you? If you were arrested for being a Christian, would they be able to gather enough evidence to convict you of being a Christian? 
You see, this matter has eternal significance. Mm. Listen, it's actually a matter of eternal life or eternal damnation. So that's serious. If you're not sure, <coughs> brothers and sisters, I pray that you commit your life to Christ today yes. and let the transforming power of God, oh God change yes. you from yes. the inside yes. out. Yes. Then you can't help but to proclaim the truth of that inward change yes. by your everyday actions and your everyday attitudes. And listen, people will notice the difference. Yes. Amen? With one.